It's always great to be here. And yes, my wife and I, we live in northern Arizona at about almost 7,000 foot elevation. People think of Arizona as all desert, but actually it's pretty similar to where you guys live here. But it is at almost 7,000 foot elevation. It snowed 14 inches a few days before we headed out here. And I think you got a couple inches since we left, which is good because like Tim was indicating, you guys have been kind of dry. We've been, we've been the same way. Uh, and I, I certainly agree that uh, we're, in a, we're in a world of hurt right now. And um, I'm going to talk about science and the Bible this morning because people have been taught today that science and the Bible are opposed to one another. Nothing could be further from the truth. It's like the trucker convoy that the media refuses to cover. And um, there's a lot right there that we're just not being told about. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. But just quickly, because Tim brought it up, we live in, a, in a, an extinct volcanic crater. It's a neat place to live. It's about a couple hundred feet deep, and it's about a mile across by a mile across. And we live in the bottom of it, and we don't get cell service because it goes right over the top of the crater. And um, so it's, it makes it a little hard to communicate, but uh, we love being there. And uh, I don't know, we're kind of like the, the, the creation ministry with an unlisted phone number, you know. But let's go ahead and uh, see if we can get this uh, picking up. It was working earlier. The guys in the back did a great job getting things going. There we go. Science in the Bible. The Bible is not a science book, but it's the true history book of the universe. And when it makes a statement that can be scientifically tested or historically tested or archaeologically tested, if it's God's word, it will hold up just fine. And my friends, it does, word for word and cover to cover. There's a lot of little nuggets in the Bible that we were told that science didn't figure out was true sometimes for almost 3,000 years. Like we're told that God sits on the circle of the earth. And sure enough, we find now that the earth is spherical. Uh, we're told in Jeremiah, probably the oldest book of, of Scripture, that the moon divides the sea. And about 2,000 plus years later, we discovered that the moon causes the tides and divides the sea twice every day on our planet. The Bible contains over 83 verses about the need for cleanliness to prevent spreading disease. These were written over 3,000 years before we discovered germs. In fact, the great plagues that killed millions in uh, Europe were ended when people started following the laws of cleanliness found in Leviticus. So God's word has been thousands of years ahead of what we call science today, which is just people. Scientists are people like anybody else, and they study things. You know, the Bible says, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Some people say to me, you're not supposed to prove the Bible's true. Well, that's not what the Bible says. God's not afraid of science. Real science just discovers factual truths, and truth comes from God. God isn't afraid of science at all. So are science and the Bible at odds with one another? I want to show you this morning that real science is your best friend. Always has been and always will be. Now, what I call real science is operational science. Operational science is knowledge that's derived from the study and testing of evidence. Things have to be testable, studyable, and observable for the findings to be scientific. Operational science, a believer's true friend. Did you know that more than 80% of the branches of modern science were started by Christians? I was speaking in a high school in, in Oregon two years ago, and I walked in, and the kids came in just cross-eyed, just glaring at me. It kind of surprised me. I expect that on college campuses, but it kind of took me off guard with the high schoolers. And God just gave this to me. Before I started, I, I just asked, hey, how many of the branches, the 200 or so branches of modern science, do you guys think were started by Christians? None. Try over 80%. You see... We thought there was an intelligent creator. He probably put some laws in place to govern his creation. And if we studied his creation, they call that nature today, we could discover some of those things and put them into practices to improve our lives. And that's what led to over 80% of the branches of modern science to study God's creation. How would you set out to study random chance? You couldn't. There would be no science without Christianity. 
Now that's been undermined by atheists over the last 150 years, and now they own the system, but all the branches of science and the greatest scientists ever, Isaac Newton, Louis Pasteur, uh, Francis Bacon, etc., Bible-believing Christians. That's the reason we have science today. Now, the Bible tells us that God formed the earth to be inhabited. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of very finely tuned uh, elements and issues found in our, uh, in our universe, and especially in our solar system, that make earth <clears throat> very special for life to exist. The proton and neutron balance has to be exactly what it is, or there'd be no life on Earth. There are hundreds of these things. Uh, just one example is the distance our Earth is from our sun. We have this perfect star that just emanates a, a very even amount of, of radiation and heat and x-rays and gamma rays to allow life to exist on Earth. Think about this. In our, in our universe, the temperatures range from minus hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit to tens of millions of degrees Fahrenheit. So the range is tens of millions of degrees. Water is only liquid in about a 180 degree range. And God put our planet right in the middle of that range. If we were 2% closer to the sun, all the water would evaporate. There'd be no life on earth. If we were 2% further from the sun, all the water would freeze and life would be difficult on this planet. It's, these things are called the anthropic principle. You can Google that sometime. But God put us in a perfect position for life on earth, especially human life. In fact, this Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist stated, the best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted if I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses. There has never been a single scientific reason not to accept the Word of God. Now, there's a lot of false teachings out there, and we're going to talk about those as well. You've got to watch out for false teachings. Uh, the Bible is the only book in the history of the world to live on its ability to correctly predict the future. There are, depending on how you add them up, about 2,000 prophecies in the Bible. And, and God tells us the way you tell his word from false teachings and false religions are the prophecies. God told us if the prophecies don't come true, it's not his word. And the Bible is almost 2,000 for 2,000. Uh, most religious texts will make prophecies, and one out of five will come true, and four out of five don't. But the Bible is uh, about... I'd say about 1,700 for 1,700, roughly. And the few, uh, there are many taking place right before our eyes today, right, Pastor? And on top of that, the, the remaining will take place during the tribulation period. But one of the great prophecies in the New Testament is in 2 Peter, they'll come in the last days scoffers. You guys ever see a scoffer? <laughs> and they're going to say, where is the promise of Jesus' return? For since the fathers died, all processes remain the same. That's called uniformity. Uh, they say, well, the Grand Canyon's this big, and the Colorado River's taking out X amount of sediment right now. It's always been the same, uniformity. So it took millions of years for the river to carve out the canyon. I take about 1,000 people a year on uh, Christian tours to Grand Canyon, and uh, I can destroy the secular interpretation in about two minutes. Uh, there's so much evidence of, grand, of rapid formation at Grand Canyon. How many of you have been to Grand Canyon? It's one of the five pillars of atheistic beliefs, by the way. So you, you visited one of the pillars of their strongholds. Because they taught you millions of years. Everything's millions and billions of years. That's their foundation. Um, I'll <clears throat> explain later why that's important, but they're going to claim uniformity. And um, one thing I want to mention about Grand Canyon, when you were standing on the rim looking down, it was a mile from the rim to the river. That's a big hole in the ground, isn't it? You know what they didn't tell you when you were at Grand Canyon? That mile was nothing. There used to be two miles of rock layers above today's rim that had been removed for tens of thousands of square miles, and there's no way to explain that but flooding on a global scale. But they claim uniform processes and deny the global flood. And that leads us to historical science. Understand, operational science, real science, is your best friend. Knowledge derived from the study of evidence. But historical science is not knowledge, it's assumptions derived 
from taking operational science, saying you can test it today, and applying those rates, like how much sediments being taken out of Grand Canyon, and extrapolate backwards to unobserved events. And that totally messes up a person's observations with regard to their assumptions. Assuming that present events have always been the same destroys the accuracy of historical science. The bias in historical science, based on uniformity and also a lot of atheism, corrupt the non-observed assumptions of historical science. It's historical science where there is controversy found between the Word of God and what they call science. Real science is your best friend. Historical science is the issue. No wonder the Bible tells us to avoid oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. That word science can be translated knowledge or teachings. Beware of false knowledge, false teachings. So how did the universe begin? Well, the Bible, the first five words of, of the Bible, in the beginning, God created. And here's some new scientists. What's the uh, secular interpretation of how life started? In the beginning, trying to parrot the Bible, and this is hard to grasp. In other words, this is going to be a hard one to believe, folks, but we think the universe may have made itself. We think there is a, a tremendous high form of intelligence behind the universe and life. The other side thinks it was a big accident, hmm. and it made itself. Well, let's go to Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. This shows that the universe is a big result, and it had a beginning. So logic holds that the cause of any result that had a beginning. So the cause of the universe cannot be a part of the universe. In other words, logic holds that the cause of the universe had to exist outside of the universe's space, matter, and time. Simple logic. The cause of the universe has to be outside of the universe. It had to exist before the universe's space, matter, and time. New Scientist says the universe may have made itself. Logic says that's impossible. Only the biblical texts claim that God is not a part of this world. The Bible has always claimed God is not a part of the universe's space, matter, and time. So in other words, logic holds that in the beginning, God created. Well, I guess a fair question would be, well, well come on, Russ, who made God? Have you ever heard someone ask you that? Or maybe you even thought that. Who made God? Well, of all ancient texts, only the biblical, biblical God claimed to be eternal. From everlasting to everlasting, with no beginning, God has always been. And my friends, that puts only the biblical God outside of the laws of conflict. In other words, this means that only the biblical God can be the logical creator of the universe. Wow. And you know why that is? because he's real, his word is true, and real science is your best friend. Always has been, and always will be. I mean, what do the laws of physics support? Well, the Bible says that God looked at his creation at the end of the sixth day, called it very good, and said the heavens and the earth were finished. God created, and he said that that's the end, creation is done. Well, the first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of mass and energy, that matter and our energy cannot be created or destroyed. In other words, the matter can change to energy, and energy can change to matter, but the total amount of matter and energy in the whole universe is set. I think when God said the creation is finished, I think what he meant was the creation is finished. <laughs> Well, let's go to Science Magazine and see how Steve Hawking explained the start of the universe without God. He said, well, there was absolutely nothing before the Big Bang. People come up to me all the time and say, God could have used the Big Bang. Well, God, God could have is never a good argument because God could have done anything, right? He could have made us out of a fudge sickle. When people say God could have this, I, I go, I go my, my theory is the fudge sickle theory. If you're not going to believe God's word, I think he made us from a fudge sickle. You know, we're on our fourth Big Bang Theory. Did you know that? 
please don't come up to me and say, God could use the Big Bang, because I'm going to say, really, which one? They've all been scientifically debunked. Which one do you, do you think he used? So Hawking says there was nothing before the Big Bang. Well, wait a minute. If matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, if there was ever a point in the past where there was nothing, there would be nothing in the present. Nothing can't make anything. So the Big Bang had a big problem. Nothing can't make anything. So they came up with their saving Messiah for the Big Bang. That's the singularity. Have you ever heard of the singularity? That's where, try to, try to, uh, try to think about this. This is where all the matter in the entire universe, not just this building, not just the entire planet Earth, but all the energy and matter in the entire universe it was squished together into a little bitty period about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. That makes sense, right? And then it exploded. Well, they'll get mad. It didn't explode. It expanded rapidly, which sounds a lot like it exploded to me. It exploded. Well, let's go back to science, see what Stephen Hawking says about the singularity. The laws of physics, they cease to function inside that tiny particle. In other words, this goes against all science and all observations, but rather than humbling themselves to the word of God, they're going to go with the singularity. We trust in Jesus Christ. Non-believers trust in the singularity that goes against every observation and scientific law. But see, they've been taught that their view is scientific and they don't realize, no, it's, it's an anti-scientific fairy tale. Discover Magazine said this guy retired after 35 years of studying the universe that he found that before our universe there was nothing, nothing at all. Now, as a Christian, I agree with the fact there was nothing before the before the universe. God spoke and boom, it existed. He, he's outside of space, matter, and time. He's the only logical creator. But from their standpoint, if there was ever a time when there was nothing, they've got problems. I mean, ask this guy, after decades of research and spending millions of dollars of grant money, what did you discover? Nothing. <laughs> well, what evidence did you find? Nothing. But you believe nothing made everything? Absolutely. That's a religious belief. You know, if you want to have that religious belief, I'm not going to argue with you. That's your choice. But I just don't want them teaching this to children who don't realize that it's not a scientific fact. We're being taught these are scientific facts. And as you can see, even from their own words, they go against science. Now, the second law of thermodynamics is the law of entropy, that things get worse and worse. Things lose energy and wear out. The Bible told us that the earth and the heavens will perish, they'll wax whole like a garment. Things are going to lose energy and wear out. And about 1,700 years later, science proved that to be true. What the second law, the law of entropy. That is the most accepted law in all of the 200 branches of modern science except evolutionary biology, which is teaching things are getting bigger and better, going against scientific law and all observations, by the way. So the second law says things get worse and worse. The Big Bang says nothing blew up and got better and better. That nothing blew up, the singularity, I shouldn't say nothing, the singularity blew up, I'm sorry, expanded rapidly, Evolving into living systems, genetic information, complexity, and intelligence. Nothing evolved into all of that. That's never been observed. That goes against real science. The Big Bang makes no logical or scientific sense. In fact, this letter appeared in New Scientist titled Bucking the Big Bang, signed by dozens and dozens of uh, scientists. And they said the Big Bang can boast no predictions that have been validated by observation, you know, by science, observable, testable, stable evidence. They said the theory relies on a growing number of never observed entities like the singularity, inflation, dark matter, and can't survive without these fudge factors. In no other field of science would this be accepted because this isn't science. It's science falsely so-called false knowledge, false teachings. But it's being taught to kids as if it were scientific fact. And everybody in this room, including myself, has been taught these things. You wonder what in the world's going on with our country. Well, you turn back to 1963. In 1962, 
the ACLU had a lawsuit that they won and it removed prayer from our schools. In 1963, we kicked out prayer and creation and started teaching our future generations they had evolved without God, that there is no God, there is no creator. You evolved on your own after the Big Bang. We've taught that as science for 60-something years, and we are reaping the fruit today. Um, take two minutes when you get home today. Two minutes. Read Romans 1, 15 to 32. Take you two minutes. And keep 1963 in mind when we get creation and prayer out of our schools. And it will blow you away with the truth of God's word. Because he tells what he will allow to happen to people who turn their back on him. And it will blow you away. You'll think you're reading a front page headline if we had real news anymore. So how did life begin? Well, again, the Bible says in the beginning God created. Uh, I spoke so many times at this one college that uh, they actually uh, made a, 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 a credit a class attacking me in biblical creation. They ran it for at least four years. For their final exam, they made fun of me for, for an hour and a half. I mean, I've been married 35 years. You think that's going to bother me? Come on. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So I went to their book written by the president of the National Center of Science Education to see how, she, how they, in the modern college textbooks, explain how life started without God. And on page 26, this was the, her explanation. The origin of life was a continuum of events with a lot of iffy stuff in the middle. Do you think maybe they have no clue whatsoever how life could have started without God? You know, the Bible, again, one of the great prophecies, this is in Jeremiah, we're told people will turn their back on God, saying to a stone thou has brought me forth. Well, come on, nobody's, you know, today we're far too scientific to let anyone tell us we came from a stone, right? Right? Well, let's go to the modern textbook, see what kids are told today. Kids, Earth is thought, believed, to have formed four and a half billion years ago, and it started out as a big ball of hot rock, and oceans formed as it rained on the stone for millions of years, and here we are today. They are teaching, and we were brought forth from a stone. I have atheists, so get right in my face. So you believe your invisible God created the world. I just say, you believe we came from a wet rock. You should try it. You'll like the result. They will, it takes the wind right out of their sails. They will stutter back, regroup. You're making fun of our position. We don't believe that. Well, uh, just say, well, I'm not trying to make fun of your position. I just don't think you understand your position. You believe in the Big Bang, right? And they'll say, yes, don't get into which one. Just takes you off on another rabbit trail. So you believe in the Big Bang, right? Yeah. Well, you believe that next to nothing blew up, right? And after billions of years, a big rock formed, right? Yeah. And it rained on the rock for millions of years, right? Yeah. Where you're sitting there with this wet, sterile rock that has no life on it whatsoever, where do you think we came from? And they'll go, uh, wow, I do think we came from a wet rock. And you've just prepared the soil to plant the seed. Because they think their position is scientific, and you've just shown them it's a ridiculous, anti-scientific fairy tale. You know, real science is your best friend. Like the law of biogenesis holds that life only comes from life. You can't get non-life to produce life. That's a scientific principle in real science, leaving secularists with the iffy stuff. What about biology in the Bible? Oh, this world-renowned atheist speaker said biology is a study of complex things that appear to have been designed for a purpose. He doesn't believe they were, but he admits they seem to be. You know, Sacralists and atheists think if you start out with the raw material to, to start life, somehow life would start on its own, even though all science says that doesn't happen. Life is far too complex with uh, genetic information and, and living systems, etc. So let's just say they, uh, we can not get life to start from non-life in laboratories. So let's just have the raw material to, to make a brick building. Let's say you had the raw material, you had the brick and mortar, they say given time and energy, great structures will eventually come about on their own. So let's give them a billion years. And for energy, we haul the brick and mortar up to the top of a five-story building. And once a second for a billion years, we push it off. How many beautiful brick structures do we come up with? We come up with this every single time, right? That is what you get with random chance. You throw in some simple human intelligence, you'll get a beautiful brick structure every time. 
The difference between intelligent design and random chance is immense. There is no comparison. In Genesis 1, we're told God created every living creature. Bees are needed to pollinate flowers. Most of us know that. Well, the bucket orchid was designed with a very slimy surface. So when a bee comes and lands on the bucket orchid, he slips and he falls into that bucket below, which is filled with, with this sticky liquid. It's a pool of liquid. So he lands flat in the liquid and he has, swims around and to get out in the side, there's a tunnel that goes through the flower to the outside. So he swims over to the side to get to the tunnel and there's even a step in the side of the flower so he can step up out of the pool and go through the tunnel. But as he's crawling through the tunnel, the walls of the flower contract and capture him while the flower glues two pollen sacs to his back. And then the flower holds him until the glue dries and lets him go. And he crawls out and he flies around if he goes to another bucket orchid, he goes through the whole process again. He slips, falls in the bucket below, splat, swims to the side, climbs up the step, crawls through the tunnel, but as he's crawling through the tunnel this time, the walls of the flower contract and capture the bee and hold him while the flower removes the pollen sacs, completing the pollination process. Please explain to me how that evolved over millions of years of time. Because if it didn't happen immediately, the pollination process wouldn't have worked, and that would have been that. Talk about intelligent design. The Bible tells us God created every winged fowl after his kind. A woodpecker can peck as fast as a machine gun can shoot. But the sudden stop when his beak impacts the log creates a force that's 100 times more powerful than gravity. So what prevents the woodpecker's head from exploding the first time he pecked a tree? Well, he was designed with muscles that pull his little bird brain away from his beak just before each impact as fast as, as a machine gun can shoot. And he has a spongy bone in the back of his head that absorbs shock. That had to all be there from the very start. That couldn't have evolved over even a day's period of time. The first peck would have been the end of the woodpecker. That's in proof of intelligent design. We could go through a million such things. No wonder the Bible says, I'll praise thee for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your brain is the most awesome living computer, far more advanced than any computer ever even thought of by mankind. Your brain computes and sends millions of pieces of electronic data to billions of nerves throughout your body through the central nervous system. If we really thought about it, the ability to do this is absolutely mind-boggling. Your eye has one and a quarter million nerve connections in a one square inch area. As you look around this room, your eye is performing hundreds of thousands of functions connecting with your brain so quickly, we just take that for granted. In Leviticus, we're told the life of the flesh is in the blood and 3,000 years later, science caught up and found the life of the flesh is in the blood. It takes blood and oxygen, nutrients to your body's parts. Uh, let me think, let's think about this. This kind of freaks me out a little bit, and hopefully it won't freak you out too bad. But what keeps us from bleeding to death when we get a scratch? You ever think about that? Well, you see, you were designed with a protein called fibrogen. It forms a fishnet -like, like structure right at the point where you get a cut or a scratch. Well, think about this. This is what freaks me out. What keeps the fibrogen from clotting up all of your blood and killing us all instantly? Well, it takes another protein that triggers the fibrogen at the point of a scratch or a cut to form the fishnet. Well, what keeps that from triggering it all the time? Well, in all, there are 25 different proteins that one must trigger the next, it triggers the next, it finally gets to the fibrogen, to form that fishnet to keep you from bleeding to death when you get a scratch. That all had to be there from the very first moment or the first scratch would have been the end of mankind. The Bible tells us the invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made so that they, non-believers, will stand before our Creator with no excuse whatsoever. Non-believers will have no excuse. 
We see God through the creation all by itself. Well, what about evolutionary biology and the Bible? The Bible says, professing to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God, which I think is creation today, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I think they're going to change creation into the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution that lets you think you're the most evolved, you're your own God. We call that humanism today. They own the system, and that's what is taught in our schools. These verses are talking about idolatry. The highest form of idolatry is to think you're the most evolved, you are your own God. We call it, again, humanism. If you understand the difference between micro and macro evolution, you would want to debate with any Darwinist anywhere from Oxford to Stanford to Harvard to your local high school or wherever. Micro evolution can also be called micro adaptations, micro variations. They're all the same thing. It's like saying I stepped out on the deck, I stepped out on the porch, I stepped out on the patio. They're all the same thing. Micro changes are <clears throat> changes within the same kind. Uh, I usually use dogs. They're easy to, for folks to understand. But you can get two mutts at the pound, a male and a female, and if they have puppies together, you have no idea what those puppies are going to look like, right? Because they're mutts. They've got a tremendously wide gene pool. You get two purebred yellow labs, your puppies are going to be yellow labs, and you know that, because that's the only genetic information they have left. These micro changes are caused by the sorting or the loss of the parent's genetic information. Dogs will only produce dogs, pine trees will only produce pine trees, people will only produce people. Darwinian or macro evolution would be a dog producing a non-dog, like a whale, a porpoise, a pine tree, whatever. Now, as of uh, an hour ago, last time I checked, there's never been one example of Darwinian macroevolution found that'll hold up to scrutiny. How many? Zero. <laughs> Everyone thinks, what they do is they show kids the, the micro changes, and then they switch the discussion to macroevolution, and people think that they, they uh, have proof of Darwinism. But the thing that real science finds is that kinds only bring forth after their kind. Again, dogs bring forth dogs, cats bring forth cats, and so forth. Kinds only bring forth after their kind. Why is that vital for Christians to understand? Because ten times in the book of Genesis, we're told plants and animals will bring forth after their kind. Ten times in Genesis, we're told that, and the only thing science has ever found is that kinds only bring forth after their kind. They could have just read Genesis and been told that ten different times. See, but kids are given lots of examples of biblically correct micro changes. They aren't explained how that's caused by the sorting or loss of information as gene pools get weaker and weaker. It's called gene depletion. Then they switch the discussion to Darwinian change, and kids think that given enough time, the micro changes add up to macro. But they don't understand the micro is caused by the loss of information. I was at a college one time, and these professors were giving me a hard time, and I, I answer the questions, answer the questions. I've been talking for about three and a half hours, and I have found that three hours is my limit, by the way. It's best to call it a day after three hours. And finally, this one professor kept going on and on, and I kept explaining micro and macro, and he wouldn't accept it. So finally, I said, let's, say, let's give you a bacteria. Let's give you all the bacteria cells you want. Forget about the law of biogenesis, and you can't get life started from non-life. Let's give you a bacteria cells. How much genetic information do those bacteria cells have to lose to become a biology professor? And suddenly he understood. <laughs> Would have been better if he'd understood about 30 seconds earlier, but anyways. And then everybody said, everybody said I was mean, haughty, arrogant, and unloving for pointing that out. But, but micro changes are caused by the loss of information, gene depletion. That's what breeders use. Breeders don't breed in information. They breed out through gene depletion. If you want to get purebred yellow labs, you breed puppies together with those traits and keep breeding the puppies with the traits till you lose gene depletion. You lose what you don't want, and you end up with a purebred, like a yellow lab, which has lost all the other information. And this is how you destroy Darwinism scientifically in four seconds flat. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. Things are losing information, and eventually they lose too much, they die off. Now, we call that natural selection. There's no selector standing there. It's actually God's quality assurance program. 
If things kept losing information, everything would go extinct in 1,500 years. They lose too much information, and they die off, so they don't corrupt the gene pool. God's QA program, we uh, wrongly call that natural selection. So operational science, a believer's best friend, will show us that the law of biogenesis holds Darwinism couldn't have started. The law of entropy holds things get worse and worse, gene depletion. No one's ever seen anything Darwinian macro evolve because gene depletion plus selection makes Darwinism a scientific impossibility. That's the reason they have no evidence. It wasn't because it got lost in the iffy stuff. This uh, philosopher stated, posterity will marvel that so flimsy and dubious an hypothesis as Darwinism could have been accepted. What about geology in the Bible? Is the earth billions of years old? Well, again, back to those scoffers, they're going to be willingly ignorant. They're going to claim uniformity and be willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. Geology, secular geology today is based on millions and billions of years, all based on the belief there was never a global flood. Why would you deny the global flood? Well, see, the old earth beliefs are based on a belief the earth's crust, so sedimentary layers laid down by water, didn't form in a flood, but formed slowly over millions and billions of years of time. That's where the old earth beliefs come from. But the Bible tells us God judged man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. Well, is there any evidence of the global flood? You know, I would think if there had been a global flood, the evidence would be overwhelming. I would think the outer crust of the earth that we live on our whole lives would be made up of sedimentary layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density by moving water. You ever see a miner with a pan? He scoops up some sediments and water. He sloshes it back and forth. The moving water separates the sediments by grain size, weight, and density. Well, on a global scale, I would expect the, the top mile or so of the earth's crust to be stratified layers. So you'd have all shale together, all sandstone grains together, all mudstone grains together. It wouldn't just be a big brown conglomerate like it formed slowly over millions of years. What do we find today? Well, the outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of sedimentary layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density. So you have all shale together, all sandstone together, etc. And those layers laid down quickly by water are full of billions of things that we call fossils that were drowned and buried so quickly they didn't have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. Exactly what would be there if the word of God was true and the word of God is true. Word for word and cover to cover. You know, trilobites are found in the lowest layer with appreciable fossils, so Darwinists say they're one of the first things to have evolved. Really? They have the most complex eye design ever discovered. A two-lens system with up to 15,000 lenses, a double lens configuration. It is so complex, it's hard to describe, and they think that was the first thing to have evolved. I think that just shows intelligent design. And I think God put those things in the very bottom just to hold them in derision. He's laughing at them from heaven. He says, the Bible tells us God has them in derision. You know, we find geologic compression events where mountain ranges of finely stratified layers laid down by water are squished together like an accordion with up 160 degree pins in the rock. But the rock's not broken. How do you bend a rock like that without breaking it? Unless they were still mud layers and the continental drift took place toward the end of the flood, when they suddenly stopped, they folded up because they were still mud. We find polystrata fossils that go through multiple layers. Those had to have been laid down quickly, not slowly. Did you know remains in all fossil-bearing layers have been found that still have amino acids and blood cells? Did you know that more than 50 non-fossilized dinosaur bones have now been found? 50 plus. They still have red blood cells, soft, flexible dinosaur tissues in them, and dinosaur DNA. How could those biological materials have lasted for millions of years? The old earth dates are based on the geologic column <clears throat> that the, under the belief that the layers formed slowly and uniformly without a global flood, just like Second Peter predicted. And they found bacteria trapped in salt crystals and the, we're told salt crystals are 250 million years old, according to the geologic column, but uh, the bacteria was still alive. How could it be millions of years old? Someone sent me this package of rock salt. The label says, according to the geologic column, it's 250 million years old. 
And at the bottom it says that it expires in June of this year. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like they got it to us just in the nick of time. So my friends, how can there be, have you ever heard this though? How can there be a loving God in this world full of death and suffering? Have you ever wondered that yourself or had someone ask you that? It's one of the first questions a good scoffer is going to attack a Christian with. And if you leave here with nothing today, nothing else, know how to biblically answer this question. The answer is incredibly simple. It's been lost because of old earth beliefs. I'll, explain, I'll show that to you in a second. The biblical answer, how can we have a loving God and a world full of death and suffering, is that God didn't give us the world the way it is today, full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. Well, what in the world happened to it? Adam's first sin. Adam's original sin brought on the curse that allowed death to enter. And that's why we live in a world full of death today, but we have a loving God. There's the biblical answer. Isn't that simple? 95% of Christians cannot answer that question today. Now you can answer it. But you know, the answer should go further than that. Because not only did it bring in death, that original sin separated us from God. And that required us to be redeemed with God. Well, we've got a problem. To be redeemed with God, you have to be 100% righteous without sin. And we're all sinful. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. Have you ever said something that wasn't true? That makes you a liar. Have you ever taken something that didn't belong to you, even a paper clip or a sticky note? That makes you a thief. We've only talked about this for 10 seconds, and pastor, we've already admitted we're a bunch of lying thieves here. So there's nothing we can do to redeem ourselves with God. So how loving is God? He's so loving that he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die on a cross. His shed blood covering our sin so we can put on his righteousness and spend eternity with our Lord Jesus in heaven. That is a loving God. And the problem with the old earth beliefs, it's not the age of the earth from a Christian standpoint. It's that the old earth beliefs put death before Adam. And once you've accepted death before Adam, you can't then tell people Adam's sin brought in death. Do you see that? And that's where the issue is. Put your trust in the non-compromised Word of God. And that's why the global flood matters. It puts death before Adam and undermines that teaching. I'm going to stop right here. And I just want to mention as I end, we have all sorts of uh, resources, books, coloring books for kids, with a lot of information, several uh, thumb drives and flash drives out there. I don't copyright my DVDs or or my flash drives. If you get any of our information, you can make all the copies you want. In fact, if you gave it to a million people, I would say praise God. Amen. So check it out there. The flash drives are really easy. We have one specifically for people to give away with the four teachings I would give to a non-believer or a struggling Christian in the very order I would present them. Um, so check those out, but let me, uh, let me end uh, with this. Francis Bacon, Sir Francis Bacon, is known as the, the father of the scientific method. And he said, a little science might estrange a man from God, but a little more will bring him back because real science is a believer's best friend. Just make sure it's real science that you're listening to. Let me end my part with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for Pastor Tim and Cindy and all the staff here and all the dear souls that are here this morning. I hope and I pray some of this information will be eye-opening and, more than anything, faith-strengthening. So we'll know we can put our trust in you and in our, our Lord Jesus, your word, who became flesh and dwelt among us, word for word and cover to cover. It's in Jesus' great name that I pray. Amen.